Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Long and Winding Road, our look back at the 1990s era of All Japan Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling, sorry, uh, one of the greatest periods of professional wrestling ever in the world, in the history of, of professional wrestling, and uh, we're going to take a look at a really good match from that era, from 1993 to be precise, and, and I'm W.H. Park, and you probably know me as the co-host of Post Perez at postwrestling.com, a show I do every month with John Pollock, but uh, joining me today, I'm very excited, uh, is one of my post-wrestling brethren, as it were. He is the co-host of the Up Next podcast, as well as one of the brains behind the Up Next uh, Patreon, which I'm a supporter of, uh, and that is Davey Portman. Davey, how are you? Hello, 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 WH. I'm very well. How are you today? I'm okay. It's it's as we record this. It's uh it's just past 11 p.m. Uh, and it, we're 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 might I might be getting a typhoon tomorrow. Oh, exciting! <laughs> exciting! I, I way actually, to spice things up a bit. Well, I actually enjoy typhoons because they they don't tend to be that strong when it hits where I live. Um, I my only concern is like if it knocks out the power or water, then I'm fucked. But hopefully that that hasn't happened yet. So you know, cross my fingers. It might just pass us. I've heard differing reports that it it might we might get the edge of a typhoon, or it might just pass us completely, and we'll get just get a lot of rain, and it'll hit Tokyo uh, directly. So you know, sucks to be in Tokyo if that happens. But I'd rather them than me, as as mean as that might sound. Yeah. Well, was it uh, Bono said? Uh, thank God it's them instead of you right <laughs> that's a good uh you know uh, what uh do they know it's christmas live aid yes <laughs> oh no band what well, was band-aid and then live aid followed band-aid that's right so, yes so you're british and you would know that reference i would know that reference because i'm canadian that exactly song was, that song was very popular when i was a when i was a middle school student in canada in toronto and you and you know your your british music as well i know you're very high on uh banana rama right i love banana rama i love frankie goes to hollywood depeche mode the smiths oasis the stone roses i could just go on manic street preachers radiohead uh pink floyd i like prog rock from england from the 1970s and 80s i i i, I have a wide variety of music that I like, and I, I I get the feeling that you do too. But I don't really hear you talk too much about music on Up Next. I it sounds weird. Like I I don't follow music really anymore. Um, which like is not like I I don't have time to really kind of be checking out stuff, like looking into new things. And uh, I think a lot of people kind of get their music from driving and listen to the radio, which I don't do. So I kind of, it sounds weird because it's not like I hate music. Obviously, I love music and my uh, my taste is pretty much kind of all over the place. But um, working in a bar as well, you pretty much get the top 40 on repeat and therefore kind of hate anything on that just because it's kind of played to death. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I enjoy multiple styles of music and it depends what mood I'm in. Uh, like sometimes I'll just want to listen to some Hans Zimmer, you know, or other times I want to listen to something a lot heavier than that. But it's uh, it depends on my mood. I used to work at HMV like I did a seasonal stint at HMV. For those of you who might not know, like if you're really young, HMV was a, a, a music store, a record store. And I used to, I did a Christmas season there once. And I cannot tell you how much I hated uh, some of these fucking songs that would come on every hour. Because it's just piped in, you know, HMV music that they play at every HMV. <laughs> it'd be like, who is it? Yeah. Who is the band? I who is the artist I really hated? Was was it called Owl City? Remember them? Him? I think it was a him or something no. like that. It's like Owl City. Was, I hated that fucking song. Owl City. Okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna look it up on <laughs> my computer. It's gonna get click clack on my keyboard. That's gonna get picked up, and then and then our good friend Wei Ting is gonna be like, uh, WH, I heard some uh, some click clacking on your uh, in the background there. Uh, is there a problem? And then it's be like, no, nah, just checking something on online their way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's one of those things as well that even years later you hear that song and it's like when someone like scrapes a chalkboard, it just takes you like it just makes you jar like anything from like four years ago. My first summer at uh, working here when literally we just had that one station that was everything on repeat. Any of those songs just 
just makes me feel very uncomfortable when I hear it again. Yeah, I, I'm like that with, I don't know, I don't, I don't really have too many bad associations with music. I tend to have more positive, like the, the first Coldplay album is something that really reminds me of my first time living in Japan back in 2000 because like one of my roommates introduced me to that to that album and and I just played it all the time. So whenever I listen to that album it just takes me back 20 years ago and I'm like, "Oh, I love this album." Like Modern Coldplay, not so much, but like the first three albums I I'm a big I'm a big fan of. But you know, one thing that has, you know, taken over uh, my listening habits is not so much music, but podcasts and including up next t- tell us a bit about up next, what you do, and about your Patreon uh, before we get started with our review, Davey. Sure, thank you. Uh, we started, uh, I'd say, two and a half years ago. It was um, Takeover New Orleans, and Braden obviously uh, hosted What's Next um, on the old uh, live audio wrestling feed. And uh, when it was Takeover in New Orleans, he, he just started doing Up Next and um creative differences if we will and um the his co-host left so i was there so he thought oh well i'll just we kind of need to get a show out it's the biggest show of the year for nxt which is uh what the show reviews so asked me to come on and i've kind of been around ever since and after i'd say like a year and a half to two years of recording up next doing our weekly nxt show we thought it'd be a good idea to launch the Patreon with the kind of launch of NXT on the USA network. Cause we felt maybe we'll start having more eyes on us as well or ears, if you will, and uh, be a good time for us to kind of see where we can take this thing. And it's been pretty much exactly a year since we launched the Patreon where we talk about all things, not just NXT, not just even wrestling. We do, Uh, our weekly AEW review every Thursday. Uh, We do a show called Best Match Ever, which which I think is the the best thing we put out, where we look at kind of classic rivalries or match types. For instance, Hell in a Cell is coming up next month. So last year we looked at all the best Hell in a Cell matches. Um, We'll take a specific wrestler and look at the best matches of their career, uh, different feuds. And it's, it's really fun. We kind of uh, pick the topic and then go on uh, to cage match and see sort of what are the highest rated in in kind of that area and then watch a handful of them look into the history of it all and kind of give our thoughts on the matches and give our ratings and what we think is the best match ever but aside from wrestling we also do our movie reviews so we have a tier called up yours which allows patrons to pick anything they want us to review it can be a wrestling show it can be a movie a concert an album whatever so we've been having a lot of wild picks just last month alone we reviewed back to the future and we reviewed the room Uh, two very very different films um and it's really fun to go and watch these and find out why the listeners kind of picked it and what it means to them and on top of that we've done our star wars reviews on the free feed we're starting this week doing uh, our Batman reviews, starting with Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. Uh, so it's really nice to kind of break out from wrestling, but we find whatever we're talking about, we still use um, still use wrestling terms. For instance, like Harvey Dent, we're doing Batman. Harvey Dent's going to have a heel turn, right? That's right. It's still kind of that vocabulary that uh, I think a wrestling audience enjoys and kind of understands um, but it, again, it's nice to just kind of get away from the squared circle as well. And then on top of all that, we do our watch alongs for pretty much any big pay-per-view. We've done um, like all the main roster pay-per-views. We do them for takeovers. We do them for AEW pay-per-views, impact pay-per-views, where we just go on YouTube. We have some of our friends from the pay- uh, the Patreon join us and we just watch the show and have some drinks and chat in the chat room about what's going on. And I think a lot of people, especially during these empty arena times where you're not necessarily getting that atmosphere through the screen, are kind of joining us to get get that kind of community feel that you would get from going to a show. And they've been a lot of fun to do and, and pretty successful. So uh, we've got our, what's the term? Fingers in a lot of pies at the moment, but uh, we're keeping busy and it, it seems to be going well. Uh, 
Uh, so we've been really enjoy, enjoying it. And we recommend if you think that we're just the NXT guys, we do so much more than that. So uh, give us a little go. We did put out a best match ever for free on this feed just last week. So uh, if you if you liked what you heard or if you're curious about what we do, give that a listen and give our free Batman review a listen as well, because you'll get a sense that we're more than just your NXT guys. Yeah, as a as a patron of your patreon i uh, i always find that weird to say patreon of the patreon a- anyways uh as a patreon as a patron <laughs> of it myself <laughs> i i do enjoy a lot of the content you put out i do say i will say that um best match ever is probably my favorite show that you guys do um and you guys have covered some of the topic that i cover here on the long and winding royal road that is 1990s all japan you've done um Best match ever shows on Kenna Kobashi and Misahara Misawa, on the rivalry of Kawada and Misawa. You did one on uh, Stan Hansen that covered a lot of his career in, in All Japan Pro Wrestling. So um, if you like this show, I would, I would definitely recommend checking out their Patreon and checking out uh, those shows as well. So I felt, Davey, because of those uh, those best match ever shows that you did, you know, covering kind of the, the people from All Japan Pro Wrestling, that you would be a great guest to have on the long and winding Royal Road. Thank you. Yeah, I this all Japan pro wrestling is very, very new to me, uh, which sounds funny to say, considering the matches we're talking about are mainly from sort of 1993. But what I love about doing the best match ever show is it it gives us the opportunity to look at those kind of names we've always heard talked about. So take a Stan Hansen, for instance, we always hear on commentary like, oh, a Stan Hansen lariat. And it, it's just a name like I've known, but I've never actually uh, seeked out any of his work. And during kind of quarantine, it was a great time to go back and uh, watch all these matches I'd never seen before. And obviously listening to your shows, and I I know how big a fan you are of this era of wrestling, um, checking out Kabashi and Kawada and Masawa, um, and just absolutely fell in love with this style. And it, it's still just mind blowing to me how like this was happening in Japan in 1993. And you look at what like WWF was producing at this time. It's, it's night and day. So it's been really interesting for me to go back down the long and winding Royal road to discover all of these matches. And um, when you asked me on this show, I, I was really excited because it, it gives me the opportunity to, to find something else that I've never seen before. And, uh, Steve Williams is, again, Dr. Death, someone I vaguely remember. He was in the first, like, WWF video game I got. I think he was in Attitude and thought the name was cool, but then played at him and his look, like, didn't really fit in with anyone else on there. Um, like, it, he just seemed kind of a bit out of place. So I was never really that into Steve Williams, but then I hear about all these things about... um how huge he was in Japan. And obviously um, you hear like Jim Cornette and Jim Ross going off about how WWF ruined him with that brawl for all and stuff. And you think, okay, maybe I, I need to give this guy another chance and, and actually watch the work he's really best known for. And I am so glad I did. Yeah. So just so we let the listeners know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be talking about uh, Dr. Death, Steve Williams match, and he's going to be facing the legendary, Kenta Kapashi. This match is from August 31st, 1993. It's a number one contenders match for the Triple Crown. The winner of this match will go on to face Mitsuhara Masawa in the following month. So there's a lot of stakes uh, in this match, Davey. And um, just but before we get into the match itself and we give a little background primarily on, on Steve Williams, um, I want just want to know your quick thoughts on the oh, what what is it about All Japan of the 1990s that you find appealing? Like what, what are your broad strokes about it? It feels very real. Uh, I like pro wrestling being presented as a sport. Uh, I, I enjoy some of the kind of ridiculousness and corniness and spectacle. Um, but especially in the last kind of five to 10 years, I've definitely got more into the sports aspect of it. And I think it feels very real to me. And um a lot of it is the style in in New Japan today that I like. Like I could see a Tomohiro Ishii fitting in perfectly in 1993, and he's one of my favorite wrestlers today. Um, and yeah, it just I can show someone if someone ever goes, 
you watch that wrestling shit, that fake stuff, I can go, okay, well, watch this. And I don't think they would think it's fake. I, I've shown people. And then you go, no, no, they know who's winning beforehand. And they're like, what do you mean? Why would they do this to each other? Um, but that's where the drama is for me. The drama is not necessarily so much in uh, person A cheated on person B with person C and therefore they're going to fight. The drama is who's the best fighter? Who's the best wrestler? And then you get these two hosses just going at it. Um, I find it so exciting and just uh, listening to the crowd in these shows, how uh, people always say about Japanese crowds being quiet, which just isn't the case. It's just different. It's not the it's not the chanting and the singing, but it's just this kind of constant crescendo from beginning to end. And by the end, it's just like so rabid. I, I love it. And it just uh, I think they're timeless, these kind of matches. I think they'd still hold up 20 years from now. Oh, definitely. You know, you know, Davey, who, you know, the people who usually can like not complain, but kind of make the criticism of Japanese crowds are quiet. It's all the foreign wrestlers who come to Japan and don't get over. Yeah, I mean, it's and I, I can understand like it's a different um, like a, it's a different crowd. And therefore, some of the things you do necessar- might not necessarily work. Um, I've performed a lot in in other parts of Europe uh, as an actor. I've worked in uh, Austria, Germany and Italy quite a lot. And there are certain things that you do for a, a British crowd that you think are really funny and get huge reactions. And then you you perform and it's it's dead. And then you realize, oh, but this is um, a, a an audience of uh, their first language is something completely different. So their English isn't necessarily as as good as a as a British crowd or an English speaking crowd. B, just like culture and tastes are different as well. And you've got to kind of adapt to that. And um, you'll see the the kind of best foreign talent in in like a New Japan or Japan are the ones that do adapt and start to to learn from the crowds. What are the tastes they like? What what do they like? What don't they like? And then we'll start getting those reactions. Um, but it could be so easy to just stay in your ways and be, oh, well, no, this worked in America. This worked in the UK. Like, why change it? It's them. It's on them. It's on the audience. No, you should always be reading your audience. Well, we'll talk about crowd reactions as we talk about this match for sure. Uh, before we get into the match itself, let's give a. I want to give some notes about Dr. Dusty Williams. Uh, he started out in the 1980s with uh, Bill Watts, first in like Watts' uh, Mid-South Territory before it becomes uh, the UWF, and then he would go on to become a UWF champion. Um, with the sale of UWF to Jim Crockett Promotions, he would then join the NWA under that uh, under that umbrella with, uh, with Jim Crockett Promotions. He wasn't really used very well. Uh, in the late 80s, he would get his first tours of Japan with New Japan Pro Wrestling, actually. But then he would migrate over to Giant Baba's uh, all Japan for wrestling and New Japan and All Japan has had historically a, a, a strong rivalry with one another. So there was a lot of like poaching of, uh, especially of foreign talent in the 80s. And this would kind of continue into the 90s to some degree as well. But it's really in, in All Japan for wrestling that Steve Williams really hits his like peak of his in-ring career in terms of like the quality of matches that he was having. Um, he would form uh, the Baba's big idea for him was to form a tag team between him and one of his rivals in America. That would be, you know, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, who was a member of the Freebirds, and they would the Freebirds would feud with, you know, Steve, Steve Williams and Ted DiBiase and Hacksaw Jim Duggan in in the UWF. And so it was kind of an interesting, you know, amalgamation of these two rivals to become this amazing tag team called the Miracle Violence Connection. And in the early part of the '90s, like the Miracle Violence Connection, the MVC would like just dominate the tag team scene in all japan pro wrestling and this is a tag team scene that included you know jumbo suruda and akira tawe mitsuhara misawa and and toshiaki kawada and then later misawa and kobashi kawada and tawe as tag teams and they would have like a lot of bangers with with the mvc and then at some point 
by the time we get to 1993, like Terry Gordy is having a lot of personal issues. He gets into a lot of legal trouble. Um, he, you know, there's problems with the drug abuse and stuff like that. So he becomes very unreliable. And so Williams is now being put into a singles kind of situation. He's being pushed more as a single star. And this is where we come to this match in 1993. It's a number one contenders match between uh, Steve Williams is getting kind of this like he's had singles matches before and he's had like really good singles matches in the early 90s but now now it's like okay you're getting the push you're gonna we're gonna groom you to become one of our top main event talents as um as you know Stan Hansen is like you know kind of being not phased out but like he's not being you know like leaned upon so much to carry the foreign talent side of the all japan roster it's like we got to look at people like steve williams we got to look at people like danny spivey and 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 other you know like foreign wrestlers who aren't doing so much in the united states but have a home in japan particularly with all japan pro wrestling and um you know some background about this particular match this is the first singles match between kobashi and and steve williams but it's not the the first time they've ever met they've met in numerous tags as i said misawa and kawada uh misawa and kobashi had faced the mvc for the all japan world tag team titles multiple times um but this this match is really important it's the debut of of a certain move that we'll be talking about near the end of the near the end of the match um and this is one of only one two singles matches they would have davy their only other singles match would would happen uh almost a year later september 3rd 1994 and this would be for the uh triple crown championship and and this is where it'd be where williams is the triple crown champion at this time he defeats kobashi and turns back his challenge and that match you know just as a as a note here, it got a four and three car, four and three quarter star rating uh, from Dave Meltzer. Um, you know, and and the thing, one thing we got to talk about with Kobashi is that he's also now kind of emerging as a as a single star. Um, he was, you know, in 1990 to 1992, he was like number three in this group called the Super Generation Army behind Mitsuharu Masawa, who's number one, Toshiaki Kawada, who's number two, and he's the number three. But at this point, Kawada has left the Super Generation Army. He's formed a tag team with Akira Tawe. They've become the Holy Demon Army. And so now Kobashi is the number two. He's Masawa's regular tag partner. But he's also now venturing out into the singles uh, into the singles division. And he's gaining a lot of wins over mid-level, like, Japanese and foreign talent. And this is, I would, I would argue that this is probably his biggest challenge today, this singles match, this number one contenders match with Dr. Death Steve Williams. It's. I was thinking as you were saying about uh, this is their first singles match, but they've met like numerous times in in tags. Now, obviously, kind of the like American structure is doing house shows, so a lot of the time you'll have the two guys run their singles matches over and over again in house shows, or if it's kind of WrestleMania season, they just practice a bunch at the PC, that kind of stuff. How much do you think these these tags are there? And obviously, they've been kind of taken away from the G1 this year, but those sort of six mans they always do are a way to get them familiar with the other wrestlers without kind of giving away that big singles match. Cause it's amazing to watch this match and think this is the first time they've kind of squared up in a singles and they seem to know each other so well and just work so well together. Do you think that's maybe why they kind of do these tags so much in Japan as opposed to in the U S well, I, I do think there's some, you know, credence to that, that, you know, it's a way to get people familiar with each other before having a singles match. Um, but singles matches are such a, a commodity in Japan, especially at this time. Like, you have to save it for, like, a big show. You're not going to just waste it on some random house show in, in Fukuoka or Iwata or, or something like that. You're, you you want to save it for, exactly. like, you know, for a big show in Osaka or Yokohama or at the Budokan Hall or even in, like, a smaller venue, but a significant venue like Corken Hall in Tokyo. Um, but also, I mean, I think this is a bygone era, Davey. I mean, there's this whole idea that you were talking about people practice their match in the PC before they do it for WrestleMania. That They don't do that here. <laughs> you, you you call it in the ring. For sure. No, and, exactly. And that's what I mean. But it's you, you kind of do want to have some sort of familiarity with the person, I guess. I mean, it was different. Yeah, there's so much more just calling it as you go at this time and not being so rehearsed. But I just think of just you watch WWE and kind of Keith Lee's been on the roster on the main roster just a few weeks and he's already burned through two matches with Drew McIntyre and stuff like that. And you just think 
there's no saving anything anymore. Whereas you could have multiple tag matches like they do here. And by the time you pull the trigger, like people actually really want to see this thing. Oh yeah. I mean, like, I mean the, the, the difference between like, say, you know, modern wrestling, modern American wrestling of today is that it's a TV product. And, and back then in Japan, like all Japan for wrestling is a box office promotion. Like they are dependent on making money True. through drawing matches and which is like, you know, like, which was true also in, in America as well as well as in mexico uh even to this day like japan is still very much a box office dominated business it has nothing to do with television television is a side source of income for most japanese promotions um right. let's so let, let's get into the match so this is this is coming from budokan hall a, a building i've had the the pleasure of being in and i and and like to me like i always say davy like if i could go back in time i would one of the things I would probably do is transport myself back to the early '90s and go to as many Budokan Hall shows for All Japan Pro Wrestling as I could, because this crowd. Yeah, is- I, I don't blame you because it, I would love to be in this crowd. They they are so hot for this match, and, and this 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 crowd is no exception. Um, they they are pretty excited right off the gate, but but their excitement just grows and grows as this match goes on. Uh, so we start the video, and first of all, I have to note. Davey, you know, I love Dr. Dusty Williams. I love his boots. His boots are fucking oh, yeah? amazing. I, I love the little flame accents he has at the base of his boots. And and he has this skull and crossbones design because he's, you know, his nickname is Dr. Death, but also has death written on them. And he would keep this this theme, this design for most of his career, you know, like, and it doesn't matter, like, in, in today's match, he's wearing like red trunks plus white boots with red accents, and you know he has black with red accents. He has yellow with blue accents. All, he has different color schemes for these boots, but the design itself stays the same. If and if I ever became a pro wrestler, I would have these little flame accents like Doctor Death did because I I love these boots so much. Okay, you love the boots, but what about the hair? What's going on there? Come on, it's, it's the '90s. What do you want? <laughs> it's just that awkward in between phase, but I feel it's just permanently in that in between phase for him. It's not. It's not short. It's not long. It's just the bit where it's like, uh, come on. <laughs> Have you seen his mullet from like 1985? <laughs> it's it's pretty bad. I you know. I will have a look now. So this is an improvement on that. <laughs> uh, I would say so. Yes, and, and it, it kind of a more of a no nonsense haircut rather than like you know kind of a you know the mullet that he would sport while he was in the, the UWF and and later in the NWA. But it's it's definitely better than, than what he was. This is definitely it's, an improvement. Yeah, it's the bowl cut fringe at the front that just really that there's a lot going on here. <laughs> I'm having a look right now. Oh, yeah. like from his but, 80s, the, the mullet I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 But but this is But at least he's got nice boots. <laughs> he's got he's got amazing boots. I love these boots. But uh I I I just love Steve Williams like he looks like a wrestler. You know what I mean? Oh, like a, a real yeah, completely. Like a real proper like amateur wrestler who would definitely fuck you up. Yeah, I mean, he started off as both a a wrestler and and a, a football player. He's like one of like Jim Ross's best friends at the time. And obviously this is like the prototype of like a Jim Ross type of wrestler, a football player, an amateur wrestler. Start off with Watts as a hoss. He can work and he's just got, he's just an amazing power wrestler. And, and that's the thing like with him, like he's just a thick dude. And you can tell like, he could probably like, like throw people around like, who are way bigger than him. And I'm not saying like Kobashi is way bigger than him, but Kobashi is almost a comparable size. But some of the, some of the stuff he does to Kobashi in this match are, are pretty impressive just from a strength perspective alone. Oh, and, and not just, not just the strength, but the ease with how he does it as well. It's, it's, you, you often see these big spots where the, someone like manages to lift up the big guy, but it's, it's kind of that struggle and the strength. Steve Williams just, Picks him up like he's a cruiserweight at points in this match. It's ridiculous. It is. So 
as as the referee, uh, sorry, as uh, as the match starts, we see uh, Williams. He's being introduced, and he's just pacing around the ring. He's just staring at Kobashi, and he just comes up to him, bumps him chest to chest, puts his nose right to his nose, and you can tell. Okay, we're we're in for a fucking war between these two. I, you just feel that right off the before they even like lock up. And uh, I have to note, our referee for this match is the legendary Joe Higuchi, one of the greatest referees of all time. What, what did you think about Joe Higuchi's performance in this match as a referee? It was great, and it it actually kind of um, – I was surprised because I, I hear him yelling in English throughout the match, like, off the hair, off the hair, um, which I was not expecting because I'm not used to hearing English from referees in, in, in Japanese wrestling. Well, Joe Kaguchi was also kind of the liaison. He's – like, what Taika Hattori is in New Japan, Joe Kaguchi was in, in All Japan in, in this time period. Like, he spoke English. He would – tell the wrestlers like their schedules he would translate for giant baba he would reprimand the wrestlers if they fucked up doing something which was very common in the 1990s as you may well can imagine and uh yeah he 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 is the main referee of all japan pro wrestling up to a time this is kind of, he's kind of be starting to wind down as a referee and then uh Kyo Iwata, one of my favorite refs, who would you know, who would kind of take over the main ref- referee job uh, from like I guess ninety four, ninety five on, and then like, but Higuchi, we can enjoy him while he's still working here. So the bell rings, Davy, and right away these two engage in this incredibly intense lockup, and they're just like tying each other up in the ropes, and like I always feel that you can tell the how intense a match is going to be. Uh, by how they initially lock up. Oh, I, I've got this written down as well. Just this uh, this kind of grapple was awesome. You, you're so used to, especially today, you get that classic grapple into a headlock and then a drop down and a leapfrog. And it's like the first five minutes are always kind of beginner's wrestling school. We go through those motions. And especially I, I hate when you get these sort of blood feuds and then people like just do a weak lockup to start with instead of just trying to, you know, punch the other guy in the face. But here it looked so legit. It looked like both guys were like, okay, you think you can wrestle? You think you're going to out muscle me here and just shoving each other around the ring while they're just hooked up. As you said, it it sets the tone for the rest of the match and you know, you're going to get a real war here. Yeah, so we continue. There's some grappling and striking going on between the two. And, and then Kobashi hits the ropes and he hits Dr. Death with a shoulder tackle. And I'm just thinking, mm, you don't really want to go that route with, with Steve Williams, Kobashi. <laughs> uh, Williams is able to catch Kobashi with a big uh, spine buster power slam that like really looks like it, it's painful. And I'm, I'm sure it was. Uh, he then puts his knee into Kobashi's back while, while holding Kobashi's arms behind him. Uh, Kobashi tries to reverse this several times before finally getting behind Williams. And then he hits uh, Steve Williams with this beautiful German suplex. And then he follows up with a thunderous lariat that knocks Williams right out of the ring. And I'm like, fuck yeah, give me more of this. Yeah, it was like Kabashi sort of as soon as Williams kind of opened his back up to him, just hits this. This suplex just looked beautiful. Um, And again, just the strength of him just being able to. It looks it doesn't look like there's ever any cooperation between either guy in the match. Do you know what I mean? It, it's not, oh, you're going to pick me up now, so I'm going to jump. It, it looked like they were legit just hoisting each other around. Uh, and this clothesline, just knocking him loopy out the ring was fantastic. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, like no one's waiting for someone to do a spot on them you know what i mean exactly exactly which is, which is the problem i find sometimes with especially like like high flying wrestling like aerial wrestling it's like okay i gotta wait here while my my opponent gets ready to hit his top rope maneuver on me but uh, you don't we don't see i'm gonna hold the top ropes and open my chest out so you can leap off and stomp rather than just you know let go <laughs> exactly that doesn't happen here so so following like you know kobashi follows dr death back onto the onto the floor and he gives him a ddt on the floor he then goes up to the top rope And he hits him with a flying lariat to Williams, who's still on the floor. So this is not like, you know, like, it's not like Tanahashi doing a fucking high fly flow. It's not as dangerous as that. But still, it's pretty impressive for 1993. And I'm sure that the the All Japan audience are like, oh, that's that's dangerous looking. But, you know, like, I would say to them, hey, wait wait till about, like, 2016 and you're watching New Japan Pro Wrestling with, with Hiroshi Tanahashi. But... Again, like Steve but Williams, but it's the size of looking... Kabashi as well makes it look so much more impressive. Even okay. though it's just a kind of 
jumping off the top. It's he's this big guy. You wouldn't want this this big guy leaping at you. Whether it's like it's not flashy, but it would definitely hurt. Oh yeah, and, and Williams is not like trying to get himself into place. He's just taking it. He's reacting to the move. Um, from this uh, this is a uh, top flying lariat. Uh, Kobashi then leg drops uh, Williams across his head as he's draped over the ringside uh, barricade. Uh, he then puts him back in the ring, and uh, Kobashi continues the assault with kicks to the head and chops to the chest. It hits another big lariat as Williams is in the corner. Uh, Kobashi maintains control, working over Williams' neck and back. I, I think this is deliberate to because he's he's going to set up, try to set him up for his big big lariat move, which is one of his main finishers. Yes, um, I, I've got here when he's just as you said, kind of chopping him down, just these like kicks and chops. Steve Williams is just standing there like a like a fridge. You know, he just doesn't move. He's just this block just absorbing all these chops um, that don't seem to really be working too well on him. And and you're just waiting for the moment he kind of snaps back and delivers some of his own. Yeah. And, and like there's this is kind of like the control segment, like apart from Kobashi in this part of the match and that, you know, he's mainly using like a rear chin lock to kind of like wear down Stan, ha- uh, Steve Williams here. Uh, what I like about this chin lock and like a lot of the, you know, like the holes that Kobashi uses is that it's never boring. Like there's always constant movement from, from Kobashi. He's always trying to adjust like positioning of where he's, you know, where he's standing in relation to Steve Williams. He's always changing maybe like the grip of his hand. So there's always something going on. And, and for his part as well, Steve Williams is always trying to try to escape this move, these holes that Kobashi has on him. He's never just lying there and taking it. So, you know, like people, we talk about rest holes. I, I never think of these as rest holes because they're not, they're not really resting. There's, there's always this constant movement, which I really appreciate about this style of wrestling in all Japan. Yeah. It's all about how you apply it and how you sell it because here it, there's no rest to it because you know it's uh, it's him trying to weaken him down. It, it's adding to the story of the match. And as you said, there's constant movement. This isn't like one guy lying on his back while the other's on his knees. And, oh, I think we're going to a commercial break here. And then we come back and they're in the same position. Um, yeah, they're, they're working the whole time. Yeah, there's always constant movement. So uh, from here, Kobashi hits another leg drop to Williams, uh, again to his head. Uh, but this time, Williams is draped across the second rope. Uh, then Kobashi lays in these chops. Uh, but this doesn't really hurt Steve Williams. It kind of serves to piss him off and kind of wake him up from like kind of like the, the days he's been feeling from the assault from Kobashi. Uh, from here, both men start exchanging strikes again. Williams with his own vicious chops to the chest, and Kobashi fires back with this beautiful spinning savat kick, just showing kind of like actually how agile and athletic he is like kind of beguiling like his his size to some degree and uh from here also there's a running knee from kobashi to williams in the corner uh kobashi goes back to the chops but again they seem to anger williams more than hurt him i kind of liken these kobashi chops to williams's chest as kind of like will like if williams was popeye these chops are his spinach okay yeah i'm with you yeah like they're just like they're just fueling his his like anger and like he's like the Hulk. The angrier he gets, the the, the stronger he gets. So uh, I got to make a note here, Davey. Kobashi's facial expressions are fucking great. You can tell like as Steve Williams is like getting more angry and he's like no selling these chops. You can tell Kobashi is getting extremely frustrated that you know his offense is not having any effect on Doctor Death here. Especially because this is his thing. Like Kobashi is known for his devastating chops and. When Williams is just absorbing each one, and as you said, kind of hulking up as it goes, he's just like, "Well, shit, <laughs> what, what what can I do?" Uh, you're you're completely right. His eyes, like how they just widen, and he's like, "Okay, I, I've got to think of something different here because this isn't working, and this is starting to frustrate me." It's yeah. it's great. So Williams uh, finally is able to mount his own kind of offense back at Kobashi. He hits him with his with his awesome looking punches. Doctor Death has some. Fucking great punches. I, I love when he like punches people in the face. Uh, he throws Kobashi into the ropes. And then from, as Kobashi bounces off the ropes, he, Dr. Dusty Williams picks him up and gorilla presses him over his head. He does kind of like, he does like two presses, I think. And then he 
throws Kobashi out of the ring behind him, which is pretty impressive. Like I said, like Kobashi, what do you think? Kobashi is like, in terms of pounds, I'd say he's like 230, 240, maybe 250. Yeah, I, he's up there. Like he's he's a, a big guy. Like this is what I was talking about earlier on. Williams just picks him up like he's Rey Mysterio running towards him. You know, it's so effortless. And and the fact that not only does he get him up and you don't see like his arms shaking or legs shaking, he then decides to press him a couple of times as well before dumping him. And the dump is even better because it, it's not like a, a throw to the outside. He just drops him and Kabashi goes out of frame. Uh, it just looks great because I don't know where he's going to plant him. And it's just like drop over the top rope and Kabashi disappears. And yeah, a, a guy that size from that height would have gone down crashing. Um, th- this was one of my favorite parts of the match and really kind of caught me off guard because I was not expecting to see Williams uh, throw Kabashi around like this. Well, so Kobashi is out, uh, outside the ring. So one thing to note is that, you know, referee Joe Gucci, he doesn't bother counting. He doesn't like start laying in the, the 20 count because he wants this match to continue in the ring. He wants Williams to go out there, get Kobashi and throw him back in the ring. So as you know, as Williams is kind of beating up Kobashi a bit on the outside, he's, he's constantly telling him in the ring, get him back in the ring. He's not going to, he's not going to double count out these guys or do any kind of count up because he knows how important this match is. It's a number one contenders match. And one of the philosophies of giant Baba by the time 1993 rolls around is that he doesn't want to do any more like fuck finishes. Cause like fuck finishes were very, very common in 1980s all japan and it got to a point where fans were just rebelling against this and giant baba was smart enough to like to read the fans to listen to the fans and say okay we have to go to a different route we're gonna have to do i want to do all clean finishes because you know like Davey, honestly like there were times where the fans almost rioted because they didn't get a clean finish to a title match can you imagine that in in american wrestling yeah, I mean, that, I can't imagine the riots. No, but you definitely see it go in waves. Like, I, I, know, I know you're not a big AEW fan, but it's one of the things I, I love about their show because they clearly see the complaints at WWE all the time with the, the fuck finishes, as you call them, or the non-finishes, DQs, whatever. And it's something that they have clearly learned on because they do deliver because I'd say, like, 95% of their matches, you're getting a winner, like a... A legit winner and especially with with all japan here which as i said is is much more of a like a, a sports like feel to it you you don't want to see these dqs or anything um and i think it always john way talk about playoff rules it is it is a thing i think you've you've got to kind of play it with the importance of the match that you let things go you you see it in in football like in a a big like cup final or whatever, people are going to be throwing in slightly more dangerous tackles than usual that the referee might let slide a few times before pulling out his, uh, his like yellow or red cards, you know, uh, because you realize the importance of it. And, and I think it, it does feel sports like as long as you're consistent that whenever it's a, a big match, this is kind of how you do it. Like, no, get back in the ring, get back in the ring. I'm not counting you out. Um, it, it just adds, as an, from an audience's point of view, it makes you realize how important this match is and therefore helps me get invested in it even more. Definitely. Um, while on the outside, Steve Williams hits a terrible-looking handspring elbow. Uh, Keiji Mudo, <laughs> he is not. But I, I applaud the effort. I give a B- minus for the maybe, effort. Maybe retire this one, yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't think wasn't it wasn't the prettiest much. thing in the world. No, probably, I don't think I see him do it too much after this. Um, uh, from here, uh, Steve Williams rams Kenny Kobashi into the ring post and then slams him hard onto the floor. Like, he got these blue mats, Davey, but, you know, th- those are pretty thin, and he's still hitting that, that fucking concrete floor to some degree. Um, and then now, now it's Steve Williams' turn to be in control of the match, and he's focusing a lot of his offense on Kobashi's back, and I, I think it's in order to set him up for either his signature Oklahoma Stampede Power Slam or his uh, Dr. Bomb Power Bomb, which uh, are both, like, you know, moves that, like, target the, the back and the neck and knock you out. So there's a lot of good, like, psychology from both guys. Like, Kobashi's working on the neck, on the head to set up his lariat, and, you know, and Williams is working on the back to primarily to set up, 
you know, one of his two finishing maneuvers that he's really well known for. Yeah, yeah, it's it. As I said, I've not, uh, I've seen a bunch of Kabashi. I haven't seen much of Williams, but yeah, the the storytelling here is very clear with both of these guys' game plan and how they're, what they're targeting and how they want to win this match. Uh, Williams uh, transitions from uh, a WAR special, a, a move that uh, Jinichiro Tenru uh, would create. Um, and then he, he turns that into this nice looking tiger suplex. And I, I can't remember too many instances where I've seen Dr. Dusty Williams use a tiger suplex. So that was kind of like really cool to see. Uh, he follows up with repeated kicks to Kabashi's head, to Kabashi's head, which only serves to anger Ken Kabashi. You can tell like by his body language, by his facial expressions, you are starting to piss me off with these kicks to my head. Uh, after a vicious chop, Kabashi bounces off the ropes and nails Williams with a jumping forearms. But uh, Williams fires back with his own running forearm to Kobashi's face. This has been a very kind of even match so far. A lot of back and forth, like trading of the advantage of the control of this match between these two, Davey. Yeah, it's... I uh, This match is kind of 20 years old. And um, I... Oh, wait, it's, it's over that. It's 27 years old. Um and yeah, it was so even. I had no idea which way this was going. Uh, I, I don't read ahead, WH. So <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't spoiled for this match. And yeah, I'm I'm biting on everything. I, I really I really don't see which way it's going. There is a, a great moment where uh, Williams is uh, showing off his amateur wrestling background by trying to get Kobashi into a, a pinning situation. Uh, Williams goes for his gut wrench doctor bomb, but Kobashi grabs the ropes. Williams then transitions into a backdrop attempt, which, you know, the the, the lead announcer, Hajime Sato, uh, you know, kind of like prompts him to yell the, the word Abunai. Abunai! And Abunai, translated into English, means dangerous. So this is where, I don't know if you ever listened to like classic Ring of Honor commentary with Gabe Sapowski as as under his uh, nom de guerre at that time, Chris, Chris Lovey or J- Jimmy, uh, what the fuck was his other gimmick name? Anyways, Gay Saplowski would yell out dangerous like like Hajime Sato all the time in his matches. And it, it's what made Gay Saplowski one of the worst fucking commentators in the history of professional wrestling, actually, because he sounds like a <laughs> fucking dork when he says it. Hajime, Hato, so, uh, Hajime Sato sounds amazing yelling abunai. And even he he sometimes will, will break into the, you know, the English version of yelling dangerous with some of these moves. Like you'll hear like like if you watch New Japan Pro Wrestling. You'll hear like Milano Collection AT does kind of a kind of a almost like a Hajime Sato kind of like homage almost in some of the commentary he does. Um, this is great. I, I I love when I hear this when when it's done in Japanese in English by by Gabe Sapowski. Not so much Davey. Right. Well, yeah, you, you can't. Some, sometimes it's just the words, right? It just sounds better in a in a different language. Um, but I guess also just like a word like dangerous it, it needs to be kind of you're not pointing out that it's dangerous but it's more of a reaction like fuck it's dangerous what he's doing you know like stop that more so than this is very dangerous right now um so i guess it the the emotion i don't understand any japanese obviously uh but the the emotion in the japanese commentary just you don't need to know what they're saying because it 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 really gets you into the matches and adds so much to it and i it's something i've definitely noticed um during kind of these this weird time we're in with empty arena wrestling and that it's the uh i can the japanese commentary helps so much i believe i i think so as well um like but like i said like uh, you know williams is trying to hit the backdrop on kobashi but you know fortunately for kobashi he's able to block uh that attempt at this time as well uh Steve Williams drives Kobashi from one side of the ring to the other with a series of chops and then hits him with a headbutt. But Kobashi counters with a kick to the face and a running shoulder block. Uh, there's a back and forth paintbrush slap exchange between these two. Uh, and Kobashi comes out of that. Uh, he comes out on top uh, with another great rolling Savai kick. I, I really love that, that, that slap exchange that these two have because I got to think, my God, getting slapped by either man with the size of the size of their hands plus like the power behind that that's that's got to feel like shit oh it, it, yeah it, uh, i'd rather talk about it than have it happen to me you know <laughs> like it's but it it's it's great to watch just 
they're not holding back at all. Um, the this kind of slap and chop exchange just, and the crowd are just eating up all of it and just getting louder and louder and louder. Uh, Kobashi throws Williams out to the floor and then follows up with an Irish whip into the barricade. He hits a barricade assisted DDT to the floor. Kobashi charges at Williams, but uh, Steve Williams is able to catch him uh, into a power slam on the floor. And I'm like, that's got to suck. Like I, I, like, I know there's a lot of control with a power slam, but like, still, like, you're getting like flipped over while Steve Williams is holding you. And then he's, you're landing on the floor with him kind of landing on top of you at the same time. That's what a power slam is. And, and I got to think that's got to suck, especially on the floor. And, and as you said, these, there is padding there, but these mats are thin. Like, I, I remember these mats when I like pee at school, just these thin mats that would have zero give to them. And you, you do like a, a forward roll onto them and it hurts your back. And that's as a kid, like I can't imagine being power slammed by someone like Steve Williams onto this thing. Cause it might as well not be there. Uh, William then tries, he really wants to hit this backdrop on Kobashi. He wants to hit him, hit it on him while he's on the floor. But you know, thank God, Kenny Kobashi blocks, blocks this attempt as well. Uh, they go back in the ring and Kobashi is able to hit a face crusher on Steve Williams. He follows up with chops, including his rapid machine gun chops in the corner. I love this. This is something he originated. This is something uh, New Japan wrestler Satomi, Satoshi Kojima would, would later steal this, and he uses it a lot in, in, you know, for, for most of his career. Uh, there's a step-up drop kick. Williams comes back with his own drop kick. Uh, Williams goes for a three-point stance uh, shoulder block, but K- Kobashi catches him in a sleeper hold and and really this is the point Davey like we can hear like this crowd is super into this match they they haven't hit the crescendo they haven't hit the peak yet but they're getting there you can hear it in in the audience absolutely and if you said before this is kind of the beginning of Steve Williams singles career so it it often takes a while before you kind of adjust to watch someone who you're so used to seeing as a tag wrestler in this kind of singles environment and i mean i'd say you'd say i guess a modern example would be like uh show and yo and you have that uh the great match with shingo takagi where you're so used to seeing uh it was sorry it was show right um you're so used to seeing him in like, like junior tag matches and then in a singles match you start to go okay this guy's quite good at the beginning and by the end you go oh i completely buy this guy as a singles wrestler and on the same level here as kenta kabashi which is incredible um yeah that the crowd are completely getting won over by this point uh williams tries to break the hole by dropping to his back but Kobashi maintains a sleeper on him. Uh, like I said, the crowd has gotten noticeably vocal, especially with their with their support of Kobashi. You start hearing the Kobashi chants. Uh, Williams gets to the ropes and breaks a sleeper. Uh, Williams is able to hit an enziguri, and then he follows this up with a splash in the corner. Uh, Williams goes for the top, uh, like a top rope knee assisted face crusher onto Kobashi, but Kobashi blocks that and hits a second road uh, superplex. He goes for the pin. There's a one, a two, a kick out. Kobashi hits two, DD, two DDTs, one, two, kick out, three big leg drops on on Steve Williams, a bridging German suplex, one, two, kick out. Holy shit. Okay, we are well into this, Davey. It is on. It is on. And Kobashi's German might be one of my favorites. It Just the bridge he gets with it and just the power behind it as well uh, looks fantastic. And yeah, this is just both guys starting to throw everything they've got. Kabashi's getting frustrated, like he, like hitting the the leg drop after leg drop after leg drop. He knows that one's not going to be enough. He knows that he needs to just keep throwing everything at Williams while he's kind of got him backed into the corner here. Uh, Kobashi uh, picks uh, Steve Williams up for a scoop slam, and then he goes to the top and hits his beautiful moonsault press for the one, the two, no! Oh my god, Davey, Steve Williams kicks out of one of Kobashi's signature finishers, the Moonsault Press, and we got, I gotta say, this Moonsault Press, it's fucking beautiful. It's so graceful. It's its the arch he gets with it. Um, like, I... There are so many different types of Moonsaults. Like, I love how Io Shirai's is so, like, snappy. Like, it's pretty low and just so much velocity. Um, whereas this, I'd say, is more like a... 
I don't think you're going to get this comparison much, but more like a Charlotte Flair, just the height and arch. It's so picture perfect. Like you could, uh, you could snapshot this moonsault at any point during it and it would look beautiful. Do, do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know what? I got to say, just on that note there, Davey, I, I'm going to say probably Charlotte Fair is more inspired by Kenna Kobashi than her father. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you there. Um, yeah, I, who, who knew we'd start talking about Kobashi and Charlotte Flair? But... <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I'm completely with you. This, this moonsault, just, it, it's one of my favorites, and especially a guy this size. Um, I, I keep mentioning the size of Kabashi, but you, you don't really expect to see this come out of him. Obviously, we, we see Kabashi do a moonsault in most of his matches, but every time I see it, it, it impresses me. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that these moonsaults eventually destroy his knees. <laughs> so, you know, by the time we get around to, oh, I don't know, 1997, to like his his career in the early 2000s in in pro wrestling, no, his knees are are pretty fucking shot, and it's because a large part of that is because of these these moon salts that he's been doing. But you know, I, I don't know if you notice this, Davey, as as you know, Steve Williams kicks out of this moon salt, you can hear this woman in the crowd like screaming with this unbelievable shrill at the idea that that Steve Williams has kicked out of Kenny Kobashi's moon salt. <laughs> did you hear this? I did. Yeah, it's amazing. Just like. But I, I love those sort of reactions. Like, I I love when it is just noise. I, like I'm, I'm not as anti the kind of chanting as you, but I think it's so just contrived sometimes and almost detached from the action. Whereas when you get such a, just a guttural reaction, like this woman right here who just shrieks, uh, it makes it so much more real to me. Well, I'm not so much... You know, like anti chanting is like, you know, I'm anti people trying to get themselves over rather than trying to enjoy the show. Like these people are enjoying the show. They're not there to like, oh, I want to make say something funny so other people around me will laugh. That's that's what I'm anti against because like I don't I paid money. I didn't pay money to hear you make a bad fucking joke and other people, you know, awkwardly laugh at it. I came here to enjoy what's going on in the ring and react to it and to enjoy the atmosphere of other people. That's why I, I so much prefer watching wrestling with a Japanese crowd than uh, like any American or Canadian crowd that I've ever had the, you know, the displeasure of being around at, at ROH shows or WB shows or WCW shows. But anyways, I, I don't want to get on a tangent like that, but <laughs> there is like, it's it, like this woman like screaming like this is so, it's such a genuine emotion. And that's what you're feeling from this crowd as a, as a viewer, like watching this, like almost thirty years later, on 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 like you know on YouTube, and the the, the quality of the video is is not you know it's not seven it's not even it's not ten eighty p it's certainly not you know seven twenty p either, but we can still get emotionally invested in this at least I can, Davy, because it's like this crowd you you can just feel like the passion they feel for the wrestling that they're watching in the ring. Oh, absolutely, I hundred percent agree. Um, the the crowd we've learned this year how much, how important a crowd are. Um, and there's nothing like the kind of raw, genuine emotion that, that kind of these wrestlers can bring out of them. And this is, as you said, where we're starting to really hit that crescendo where they're just eating everything up and getting so into it. And obviously this is now the stretch where we're going to get near fall after near fall and they build on each and every one. Yeah, so at this point, also, there's a large and loud Kobashi chant. Uh, there's another moonsault uh, attempt from Kobashi, but this time Steve Williams gets his knees up. Uh, Steve Williams hits a three-point shoulder tackle. He hits it this time. He actually was able to connect with Kobashi. He goes for the doctor, the doctored bomb, but you know Kobashi shifts his weight in mid-motion of this move and lands on top of Williams. Uh, he, Kobashi is able to get a two-count from that. There's a running lariat from Kobashi that like just kind of really like almost takes off Steve Williams' head, but he only gets a two count from that as well. So he's starting to bring out the the, the big weapons against Steve Williams here, Davey, but like they're 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 not keeping Dr. Death down. It's like he's Dr. Death is like really fucking pumped to to win this match. He wants to get that title shot against Misawa. Yeah, he's throwing everything at him. I, I he starts even like chopping him in the side of the head, just like every, everything he's got, he's throwing at Williams, and Williams is kind of just 
like just shaking his head and like taking it all in and you're just waiting because you know at any second he's gonna snap and make his comeback uh, Williams avoids a running knee in the corner. He picks up Kobashi and hits the Oklahoma Stampede Power Slam. One of his finishers. There's a one. There's a two. Kick out from Kobashi. This crowd is going fucking nuts. Uh, Williams goes for his own layer. But then he gets a two count on this. Uh, you mentioned this before. The chops to... It, they're kind of to the top of Steve Williams' head, actually. They look kind of comical yeah. almost. But but still, I imagine they, they, they don't feel well. They don't feel good at all. Uh, Kobashi goes for the schoolboy roll-up, but only gets a two. And all these two counts, all these false finishes, Davey, they're just like they're just driving the crowd insane with excitement. They like they don't know what's happening, but they're just fucking along for the ride. Oh, it, it's wild. Yeah, it's just completely wild at this point. Okay, so Williams, this is this is like probably the the peak of this match. Okay, so Williams charges at Kobashi. But Kobashi tries to turn it into another sleeper hold. But this time, Steve Williams hits the back drop driver, fucking Abunai. He all he drops him right on Kobashi's head. This looks scary as shit. I screamed when I watched this. It it just kind of came out of nowhere for me. I mean, we've seen so many variations of suplexes and stuff, but the way Kobashi just folds up over his head um the force williams is bringing him down like this was dangerous <laughs> as you said uh so scary looking but just uh, kind of what this match needs like after everything we've seen it's gonna take something like dangerous and incredible to finish this thing so you know i i checked with like three other people who are who are experts of this, you know, of all Japan of the '90s, and I asked them, "Is this the debut of the backdrop driver? That you know, like the, the this is kind of the start of the head dropping, you know, like era of all Japan? It, it starts with this move, and they all agreed. Like all three people I asked said, "Yeah, this is this is we're sure this is the the debut of the backdrop driver right. of this head dropping movement." That to be honest, like I'm not a fan of it, like. You know, even when I started watching All Japan, of course, like I'm blown away by it. But at the same time, I'm like, Jesus Christ, these guys, I don't want any of these guys to die from this move. And and unfortunately, like you know, this kind of a move is what ultimately will, will kill Mitsuharu Masawa. Like, some, yeah. you know, years down the line, it's a, it's a similar move. Um, but, you know, like you kind of like knowing that it doesn't kill Kobashi, like you, I can kind of get into it. But I, I don't really I'm not a huge fan of the legacy of this move and like kind of like the trend it creates in in this company because it it does i think shorten a lot of people's careers it's it's one of those kind of conundrums that as a wrestling fan you you kind of ask yourself um i i I relate it i mean i wasn't dropping people on heads but um i was doing a play once and there's it's all my sons by arthur miller and there's a scene where I realized that my like dad has been lying and is responsible for this like awful, awful thing. And the character I played kind of loses it at him. And we did this scene in rehearsals and the director was like, that was great, but it was too real. I was like, what do you mean? It's too real. He goes, it's too, it looked too dangerous that you're going to take the audience out of it. And we, both as the actors knew we were being safe and we were like, what are you talking about? That's what, (laughs) sorry, that's what acting is. We want the audience to get into it and believe it's real and had this argument back and forth and watching this, I, I kind of sort of see it from the director's point of view because it's incredible to watch, but also you have that question. And especially with hindsight, with, um, concussions, head injuries, like, Masawa's passing you kind of go oh that looked fantastic but I'm also like scared at this point and I don't really want to feel scared watching wrestling but also they've done it anyway and it looked brilliant and really added to the match and the fact that it's drawing that emotion out of me it 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 leaves you feeling kind of conflicted Uh, as you said you don't want to see this all the time but oh it but it looks impressive. And to know that Kabashi is fine after this, um, 
kind of makes you feel okay. But if we would see this, if we would see this on the pay per view on Sunday, um, you'd be questioning afterwards. Oh, I hope such and such is okay, and that kind of thing. You, do you know what I'm getting at here? Oh, definitely. Like I, I, I kind of have like not a dilemma with myself, but like you know, it, like kind of as an audience member, as someone who really like loves this, you know, like the style overall. But and also, you know, part and parcel with that, you know, as we get on into the, the the mid and late '90s, is like, well, you know, head dropping is part of it. And at the time, you know, at the time when I'm a fan, like in the 2000s, and I'm seeing this actually kind of migrate over into the American indie scene, like I love it. You know, like I'm not really thinking about their safety to the extent like it's in the back of my mind, and like I sometimes, oh God, I hope they're okay, but. You know, watching this on tape, like watching this 27 years later, it's like, you know, I, I can enjoy it kind of guilt free, you know, but at the time, I can't even imagine. But that being said, Davey, this crowd is loving it because they are oh, yeah. just like, like they are, inc- they're, they're not concerned at all. I, I, I don't get a sense of concern from the cheers and the, and the noise that the crowd is making. They're, they're well into this, but and that's a good thing for them because Davey, you know what comes up? right after this it's another fucking backdrop driver this one's even more dangerous okay this this one's vertical looking he drops straight onto his fucking head again this was the worst one of the three i think and i'm gonna make a weird comparison again here but have you have you seen breaking bad no ah okay uh, it, it's hard to make the comparison but, but go ahead um, because like i'm sure our ba- listeners like you know the listeners have basically the spoilers end of season four the kind of big bad of the series gets blown up or you 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 know that's the plan he gets literally blown up but then the door opens and he walks out of the room and you go what like how the how the fuck is he alive like what's happened and then the camera pans around and you see the other part of his body which is just destroyed and he just collapses and this moment reminds me of it because he eats, as you said, this even more devastating backdrop driver right on top of his head. But then he gets right back up right after. And the crowd are going wild, like, how is Kabashi moving? And he gets up and he walks towards the ropes and pulls himself up. And you're like, how? And then he just kind of collapses back into Williams. But it's just this this couple of seconds where you believe Kabashi is still in it and still has life in him and is just kind of almost no selling this move but it i don't know it it made it so much more special building up to the final backdrop uh driver yeah and that that that's that follows it like you're saying kabashi doesn't stay down there's no attempt for a pin um he staggers up he gets to the ropes he pulls himself up and then thankfully williams hits a third backdrop driver but this time it's it's with a bridge it's not as dangerous looking as the, as the second one and he finally gets the one the two and the three um and this match is over and this match really it's it's pretty awesome davy what are your thoughts about this match i i loved it i i watched it twice uh, for this review because um sometimes i find when i'm i'm noting a match i i'm kind of sometimes paying too much attention into like like making notes rather than just experiencing it and feeling it so i wanted to watch it for the first time completely like computer away phone away and just watch and enjoy and i got so sucked into this and by the end i'm sort of jumping up and down i'm screaming at these devastating moves um it and then just and then the second time i watched it which was just a day later i i just i was into it just as much second time round and this 100% 100% holds up today. I think you could show to any sort of wrestling fan and they'll they'll get enjoyment out of this. The the storytelling of both just kind of just trying to grind down their opponents so much so they can hit their those those big kind of killer moves. Um it's kind of as you said Steve Williams coming out party is like a, a singles wrestler and Boy, does he deliver with it. Um, the crowd being so behind Kabashi as well that they're just willing him uh, to kind of kick out after every single move that Williams hits. 
Um, and the, just the final stretch is just relentless. I I love this, and I'll I will definitely see myself putting this on again. Uh, probably late night uh, after Brayden and I have had a few drinks, uh, I'll probably show this to him because um, yeah, I I thought this was awesome. Well, maybe maybe I'll be uh, maybe I'll be over at the BDE if you show this to Brayden after having a couple of drinks. Yeah, maybe I'll join you for that. Yeah, hopefully. Absolutely. I, I like just, to, like to see. I, I just get your see test. I want to see. I want to see your negative test, and then absolutely. <laughs> oh, definitely. I, I'll, I'll definitely show that to you. Um, I just kind of <laughs> want to see Braden's real time reaction to, to see the back jump driver. The second one, especially. Um, but uh, I love this match. I I would go if I was to give it a star rating. I would go four and three quarters for it. Uh, I know Meltzer gave it a five star rating, and and I don't disagree with that. Just for myself, I. I don't know. There's just something. Uh, I could have been just uh, could just been a little bit more. I don't know what a little bit more could have been done, but I, I, I'm going to just go with a four and three quarter rating. Uh, what about you? What would you rate this at? I'm the same as you. Uh, I think I can never quite put my finger on when something is a five star match for me. But as soon as the match is finished, I know it's a five star match. And there's there's nothing like I can't this i can't go oh if they just did that i'd give it that extra quarter star but it's just that feeling i have after and i'm going 4.75 it's it's a damn good match and i wouldn't uh kind of criticize big day for giving it a a five star at all it, it, you can totally argue that it is but for me it's just a feeling i get coming out where i just i know right away that it's a five star um but this so as i said so rewatchable i've watched it twice in just a couple of days and would happily watch it again uh both guys just throwing everything they've got at each other it it makes me want to watch their um was it a title match that you said september september 3rd 94 yeah a year almost a year later to this match so they'll my birthday there you go let's go go watch it go watch it best match ever best match ever steve williams versus ken kabashi (laughs) Yeah, two singles matches you can watch. It's not going to be a very long episode, but you know, I, no. I do want to mention like post match, we see like Kobashi and Steve Williams, like you know, shake hands. They embrace like a great show of sportsmanship. And I, I, I don't want to see this all the time in wrestling, Davey. I understand like we have to have like blood feuds and hatred and like you know shenanigans sometimes post match, but. Sometimes you just want to see two people shake hands after they've almost killed each other, and we we got that. I just thought it was a beautiful moment, and I, I can you can tell the fans really appreciate it as well. And here's the thing: like they're firmly behind Kenta Kobashi. They're not necessarily ever against Steve Williams. They just like Kobashi more than Steve Williams because he's their boy, right? But they have a deep respect for Steve Williams. He's been wrestling in all Japan for the like like the last three, four, five years. They're very familiar with him. They appreciate that he spends a lot of time in All Japan Pro Wrestling and putting on these killer matches for them, whether it's in tag tags or singles. So that's always something I like to see in, in wrestling. It doesn't matter what country it's from. Yes, I agree. And I think these kind of moments, like the handshake, the uh, the kind of standing ovation moments, have to be earned. I know... WWE do that thing sometimes where a match ends and they'll leave the guy in the ring to kind of encourage the crowd to do the standing ovation. And it's like, no, that that didn't really deserve it there. Um, but when like these two just absolutely going to war here and. And I, I like to think this sort of handshake was just a kind of spur of the moment thing where, wow, we we put on something special there and we beat the piss out of each other like thank you for that match and well done. Um, and also it, it gives, as you said, this crowd are not anti Steve Williams, but they're so behind Kabashi. It kind of shifts all of them to now be behind Steve Williams moving forward into that title match. Cause it's kind of Kabashi almost anointing him and giving the crowd permission to cheer this guy. Yeah. And, and kind of like, so the result of this match is like Steve Williams would get, a shot at Mizuhara Masawa's Triple Crown title on uh, September 3rd of 1993. Uh, he would fail to take the Triple Crown from him. But like later on, of course, he becomes Triple Crown champion and he would defend uh, that belt against Kunikobashi in the match that we just mentioned 
as well. Um, yeah, that's so that's it. I, I again, one one last thing is that like this, I thought this match was great, not only for just as a standalone match, but as well as kind of in the larger context of both of these guys getting their like their singles push like williams is now kind of divorced away from terry gordy so he's kind of on his own kenna kabashi is starting to you know he's being masawa's tag partner but he's also being pushed as a star in his own right along with masawa along with uh, and along with toshiaki kawada so i think it's a very important match i think this is you see that clip of the backdrop driver a lot in gifs and like in in like video highlights like on youtube and stuff like because it's like it's a signature moment for both steve williams and for for kenna kobashi and like and like there's a lot of moments where you see kenna kobashi just absorbing punishment it's part of his appeal his kind of f- refusal to like like stay down and just be able to take an ungodly amount of punishment and and i just think that you know this is kind of like you know part of that journey for kobashi especially to where he reaches the, the, you know the pinnacle of you know becoming the triple crown championship champion himself he becomes like the the most important ghc champion in in wrestling noah's history and he's a legend in in japanese professional wrestling he's actually one of the you know of his era he's one of those stars that transcends into mainstream like the public consciousness in in, in japan oh right like he's just like he's at that kind of level where even if you're not a wrestling fan, you know who Kenta Kabashi is. Yeah, like he he'd be like I don't know, like I suppose like John Cena. You know, people know who John Cena is. People know who The Rock is, and it's not because you know Kenta Kabashi did movies or anything like that. It's just like you know he was wrestling was such popular, was such a popular you know form of entertainment. Like when he was a star, that you know it translated that people you know who never seen any of his matches know who Kenta Kabashi is. So it's 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 really cool to go back to like when he's still kind of like, you know, in the, the, the kind of like the mid part of his career before he becomes a top, a top guy. So I really recommend this match for anyone who, who uh, hasn't seen it, go watch it, go watch it twice. Like David did. You, you'll pop, you'll pop big. I think there's a lot of nuances in this match that you can, you can get from multiple viewings of this Davey. So like, definitely like I, I, I'll probably watch it again, uh, either by myself or maybe, in the near future with you and Brayden after I show you my negative COVID test, of course. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, yeah. So let, let's let thank you for coming on to the long and winding Royal road. I definitely want to have you back on again. Um, and yeah, like where can people find more of your work? We talked about up next, but where can people find more of Davey Portman? Yeah. So uh, search up next on any podcast app upnxt also on spotify uh, you'll find us all our free shows uh mainly nxt but you've got all our free star wars reviews you'll be having our batman reviews on there um also if you want to support the patreon uh, patreon.com forward slash up next uh if you want to throw you can throw us uh two dollars five cents to be a cruiserweight champion which gives you uh, a few free shows a month but if you want uh the main package it's only five dollars uh you get uh all our shows best match ever uh the movie reviews um the world champion reviews uh and up next row where we talk about aew and if you really like us you can be a world champion for 25 dollars, where you can pick what you want us to review you can come on the show to talk with us you can be on our watch alongs um so that's that as well follow us on twitter at up next podcast uh on instagram now as well at up next podcast we've got the up next group on facebook just search up next podcast there and we often do like polls for shows you want to hear down the line uh follow me personally at davy portman uh and i just want to apologize uh during that i don't know if it picked up on audio but there were some cameos from my cat Ernest, he was kind of jumping on my head and meowing a lot and biting my feet during that. So I, I hope none of that comes across. But if there were weird noises that you were going, what's going on there? It was just Ernest the cat. It, it was Ernest just being excited about backdrop drivers and and people getting dropped on he, their heads. I'm sure he did watch the match with me. Like he's he's a very hyper eight month old kitten. Um, but as soon as he saw. Uh, kind of kabashi come to the ring he kind of shut up and just 
just started watching. It must have been the orange tights, you know, like those. I'm sure. I think so. Mesmerizing for cats and, and dogs as well. Yeah, but uh, absolutely. Davey, again, again, Davy, thanks so much for coming on here. I'd love to have you back on down the line. Uh, it's it's going to be a like I said, like the title of the show. It's a long and winding royal road. So like, you know, I'm sure we're going to have plenty of opportunities to talk about other uh, classic matches from the 1990s All Japan Pro Wrestling promotion. Uh, for the listeners, uh, like I want to thank you. I want to. Th- I want to thank the listeners for for supporting the show and and giving me such great feedback. And uh, yeah, until the next episode uh, coming out uh, next month, I will say goodbye and thank you very much. Ahoy!